Kate speaking. Hi Kate, it's Angus from HS calling. How are you? I'm great, thanks Angus. How are you? Very good, thanks. As you know, we're only a couple of days away from closing our OCI, and I just wanted to ask if you've got a problem in State 4. Oh, why do you ask? The reason why I'm asking is because the survey response rate there is much lower than all the other states. Well, it's funny you should say that, Angus. Some of our performance data is telling us that we've got a problem there. But the leadership team is attributing those problems to external factors. We suspect it's more than that, but I guess the survey will tell us that conclusively. Does a low response rate usually translate to poor culture results? Mm, usually, yeah, it does. Wow, that's some pretty special acting right there. I bet you um, <laughs> DB should be regretting getting me up here after all. Look, what that call was trying to reenact was uh, a call that took place in early 2016, when we were just days out from closing our annual OCI survey. What that call highlights is the way that we've come to see culture at shape, in that it's a leading indicator of business performance. Over our 30-year history, we've certainly had some highs and lows when it comes to culture and that business performance, and today I want to take you through some of that story. Now that we've got the clicker working. Um, I better start by telling you a little bit about who we are and what we do. We're building contractors and we specialise in the fit out and refurbishment industry. We're the ultimate service provider in the only point of difference we have to offer our customers are our people. So that's where the second part of our vision statement up here that you can see suggests. To do that, we need to make sure that we have the best people that the industry has to offer. In terms of what we do, um, so how we do it, we turn over about $600 million annually. Uh, we've got about 370 people across our seven state operations. And to do the, to do the work that we do, we have about 3,000 subcontractors on our building sites any one day, so a lot of people to manage. So what's rolling through here is a bit of a snapshot of the type of work that we do, the type of clients we work for. Uh, and those projects can range from anywhere from 50,000 to 50 million. The defining moments. So like any business uh, that you're sitting out there today, we've definitely had some defining moments which have affected our culture, both in the positive and negative sense. I'm definitely going to share some of the, the good, the bad and the ugly in regards to what has affected us and how we've handled some of it. Um, if there's anyone in the audience that might be considering a fit-out coming up, just make sure you concentrate only on the good stuff, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go through the years of 30 years. Don't worry, it'll, um, it'll happen quicker than, it'll, than it appears. We commenced operations in 1989. We weren't always known as SHAPE. Uh, we were founded as ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good to get that. So it worked really, really well for the first 26 years of our history, but uh, as you can appreciate, um, it did become a bit of a branding challenge and, and we changed in 2016. <laughs> Not demolition contractors. Um, so the, the company was founded by, by six, six mates who came together to start the business. And the business was very much founded with sound business planning and very much solid risk management principles. So being a contractor, that's obviously imperative to what we do. Over that time, we experienced uh, steady growth. Um, and by 2004, all but one of those original founders had uh, stepped away from the business to make way for the people that that identified um, and succession planned on the way through. We'll get into a little bit more detail now as we go through the years. Um, we definitely uh, call this period of four years the change period for SHAPE. The reason being, um, in the beginning of 2004, we swapped out our board of directors uh, due to the retirement of our current chairman. With that new board, some very aggressive growth strategies were developed where we're essentially looking to, to grow the business or double the business in a very short period of time. In that period, we were also acquired, 35% uh, of our business was acquired by a venture capital partner. And as you can appreciate, having external focus into the business uh, certainly changed the way that we, we were looking to run it. And something very noteworthy was uh, towards that period, um, a HR function was established. So thank, 
thankfully for me. Um, we hadn't had a HR a central or any HR function up until this point. The business had just kind of ticked along um, operationally. So as part of that establishment of the HR function, um, our, our HR director at the time introduced us to the Circumplex through, um, through the culture survey. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, that was our Circumplex in 2008. As you can see, we were pretty heavily focused on the task side. Um, the expectation really at the time was kind of to stand out, take control and, and really get it right. This was as a result of the board and the leadership structure at the time, um, and that was evident in what we were seeing there. 2009 to 11, we'll call this growth period, uh, I guess. Kicking, um, kicking that era, era off, we did reach the growth strategies that had been put in place in that previous four years. Uh, our employee numbers peaked at 500, so we were only at 250 previously. And what you can probably appreciate with such rapid growth was the structure as a result of that. So we ended up with a very top heavy management structure uh, and probably a lot of um, additional roles in the shared services function that we, we, we might not have even needed. Also, uh, during that time, we had a, a change to our shareholder uh, agreement in that we would look at some new build opportunities. And as a result, we really did lose it. We, had, we were a little bit confused at the time about what our core, core purpose was um, and what our direction was. And as a result, we had lots of uh, aggressive leadership styles emerging, um, you know, kind of turf war politics or that sort of thing. It was to be short-lived because we'll call this period um, the shit period, I think. No other way to, to put, put it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> 2012 is um, also known as the GFC for shape. Um, it did hit us a little bit later than what other, especially financial services, um, would have felt it. Uh, and that was really as a result of uh, the fact that we had a lot of uh, larger projects keeping us afloat through that time. But they did end. We had competitors and subcontractors folding around us and we were forced to drastically uh, shrink with the market. So unfortunately, all the work we'd put into attracting 500 great people, we had to radically reduce that down to 350. As a result, those growth structures uh, were dismantled. And at the end of that period, as you can appreciate, business was really, really tough. We'd stopped measuring culture. There was no budget left for anything like that. Um, and we just did a basic engagement score, which um, was very, very low. 2014, we'll call this reborn again. Um, by the time we'd reached this uh, 2014, the market had begun to stabilise somewhat, um, and so had shape, I guess. Margins were still incredibly low, and the vulnerability of our 350 people um, was there. As a leadership team, we had to find a way to thrive in this new way of working. It was, at the moment, we were only surviving. Uh, everything had come down to t tendering and, and winning work on price. And we knew that it was only going to be a race to the bottom if that's the way that we were going to survive. So did we want to be a commodity player or did we want to be special again? And thankfully, we had a leadership team that did want to be special. And how would we do that? We needed to redefine our purpose. And given that all, all the only asset that we really have at Shape was in it with our people, we knew that the answer had to be within them. So there was only really one thing left to do, and that was to rebuild our culture. But how were we going to do it? This period is just going to talk about some of the things that we did uh, as we'd identified that's what we needed to do. And it's certainly, certainly for us, what was very obvious, and there was a lot to do, um, and we, we weren't quite sure where to start, um, but the most obvious thing for us was leadership. It, it very much differed state to state. We had seven state operations. Um, and you'd only need to walk into one state to kind of get a feel for, for the operating culture in that state. So we still had no budget left, though, um, because margins hadn't magically um, improved. And we loved the idea of, of the HS tools, um, given that we'd had used them previously. And we decided to go and get ourselves accredited. So uh, myself and 
our COO at the time, who was also a founder of the business. Um, we totaled off and, and gained our accreditation and came back and really just worked within our senior leadership team for a period of, of, about, of about 12 months. Um, and it was about resetting the expectations about what it took to be a people manager at SHAPE. Also what we did was we, we became fascinated with the GSI tool. Um, everything that we do is within a project based and project teams. And we just went about for, across the country giving, giving our teams, giving our people exposure to the way that teams operate. So I guess a little bit back to Corinne's presentation this morning. The other thing that we, we did, and I think it's worth noting, and he's in the crowd, so I can't make my accountant joke today. Um, we went, our CFO and our head of strategy uh, went and, and became accredited. Um, they're very humanistic individuals to start with. Um, but for anyone out there, if you have budget issues, get those two accredited because they all go away. <laughs> <laughs> they understand it. So, was it worth it, all that two years of hard work that we put into kind of a redefining leadership at Shea? That's just a reminder of our 2008 Circumplex that we showed you previously. And the retest for 2016 was, was marginally be better. We were pretty happy and high-fiving ourselves um, that we'd made some shift into that constructive zone. What we didn't know, though, was what we were actually going to find in the detail. We hadn't really understood up until this point the power of data. We have seven state operations, as I've already said. And when we looked at some of the circumplexes for those individual states, there were some polarizing results. Um, what I'm going to show you now in a bit of a deep dive is the bookends. The best two states that we had from a culture perspective and the lower two. State four was the amazing phone call that we started with. Um, we hadn't even closed that survey and Angus knew that we had a problem in that state. We did know that there were challenges. Um, in, in the state, as I said, you, you did only need to walk into it to have an understanding. But what we didn't know is what was driving them because the leadership team were very much talking about external factors as being the main driver. What we then started to do though was how is this, this, this culture, how is it actually impacting our business performance? Um, we measure our, our company performance uh, against five key strategic themes um, and then again against a balanced scorecard out of 100%. So when we looked at states one and two, um, more than a pass mark, and the profitability in those states was, was fantastic. When we looked at states three and four, though, it was a very different story. Not only were we not even making a pass mark, but obviously we were losing money um, out of these states. From this point, it's fair to say that it, we got the attention of the executive team. If we didn't make a change, it, nothing was going to change. We had to say, did, did we want this to continue in states three and four? So tough decisions were need to be made, and they, they were. And what we really saw throughout this is that leadership drives culture, and culture absolutely drives performance. So yes, as I said, we were a little bit obsessed. And for the last two years, culture has become our number one strategic objective at SHAPE. It's in our mantra. It's all that we talk about. So just to give you a little bit of a snapshot about some of the things that we've done over the last two years, so 2016 to 18, we now have over 160 of our people, so almost half, exposed to LSI through our own internally developed program. We now have 12 internal, internally accredited practitioners, and they range from group executives, general managers, and most importantly, some, we've got some site managers, which is very exciting for us. We've continued the GSI for all, and even taking that down further uh, into our subcontractor base. And the OCI, we've kind of handed over now to our state teams and, and the people. So we have an OCI com committee and action plan for every state that it's actually run by, by the people. And one I hope to be able to talk about in the future is how this is going to impact the way we actually run our projects. As I said, we've got 3,000 subcontractors on our sites on any given day. And it's our ability to, to get them to do what needs to be done, which will ultimately determine the quality. 
We've, run, we've had a couple of large projects recently where we've started to do GSI and bringing subcontractors in at the start of projects and we're seeing some really phenomenal uh, results so hopefully we'll keep you updated down the, down the track. So again, yes, number one emphasis, a little bit, of, bit obsessed. So what and has it been worth it? So just to give you a bit of an idea about what this year's culture survey results were for us, that's it popping up there for 2018. Um, we're very proud, again, to have achieved a sustainability award um, and, you know, it, it definitely hasn't been easy uh, to maintain that, that's for sure. So the difference between 16 and 18 up there, these are our five strategic objectives and how we measure them. And what we're showing you here is the average annual percentage improvement since the 2016 financial year to the FY18 we've just closed off. The two, they're all critical for us, obviously, um, in terms of our client satisfaction. Um, recordable injuries is obviously safety is our absolute number one priority at SHAPE. But the revenue and profit is the one I want to draw out. Um, profit, obviously, 84%. I think everybody, every, every shareholder, every business person wants to see that kind of percentage improvement. But the revenue is the most critical factor for us in terms of measuring. We haven't just grown by, by sales. Um, we have grown the profit because of the work that we're doing internally. Our people aren't leaving us as quickly as they were. And our customers are happier. But is it a fluke? Is it just one result? So I want to now take you back through those results of state three and four, where we made the changes. And has it been worth it? So again, remembering our FY16 culture change before we made some leadership changes. And this is their culture result this year. So a very happy bunch, let me assure you. But what about their results? Is it the same? Pretty, pretty much. Except what we're seeing there now, unplanned staff churn is obviously a lot more, a, a lot better. But again, that revenue and profit ratio is still pretty, pretty much the same. What about state three? 16 to 18 again. Yep. State three is probably, not that I have favorites, but maybe a little bit I do. Um, <laughs> state three is very close to my heart because it's definitely one that you could feel when, when I talked about uh, earlier. It was evident when you walked into, the, into that state that it was a little bit different to the rest of us at that time. And the general, new general manager that took over in that state, I'll just share a little bit of a story to give you an idea. Um, he is just, a, he, he's, you can only describe him as the ultimate coach in terms of his leadership style. And he'd been in the role for about three months when I went up um, to do, do a, a, a visit. And a couple of people grabbed me. I hadn't long been in the office, and they said, we need to talk to you. Our general manager doesn't know what he's doing. I'm like, oh, OK. It's happened. <laughs> um, and so I asked some questions. And basically, what they were saying is that every time we go to him, he asks us a question. <laughs> he, he, doesn't, he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> we, and that's. Uh, we had to kind of take Steed and say, well, you know, that is his style. He knows that you know what you're doing. You're very intelligent people and we pay you to do your job, so he wants you to be empowered to do it. Um, anyway, we grabbed the whole state in and we actually took them through that leadership style because it was foreign to them. What you can see is for a very long period of time, they had been operating in a command and control environment where they were used to being told what to do. We weren't allowed to make decisions unless it was signed off or we were following a process, etc. Um, and so that's something <laughs> that we'll always remember is, yeah, make sure you tell people what your leadership style is if they're not sure. <laughs> and so what about the results for this state? Are they similar as well? We didn't have one staff member leave in that 12-month period prior to here. So we went from having a, a churn rate of up near 60%, to, to zero over that, that time. The annual, average annual profit is 299%. I got asked why we didn't make it 300, because a bit perfectionistic, obviously. <laughs> and again, the revenues. 
hurting less people still. Um, and of course our clients, again, are, are much happier. So just to wrap up, this is why Shape absolutely sees business, a cu culture as a business driver. And some of, the, some of the things I just want to leave you with to conclude. For us, we know where we've measured and where we haven't measured culture, that if you don't, you can't improve it. That period where we probably needed it the most and we didn't have it, um, in hindsight, we, we wouldn't do that again. To the HR practitioners um, and consultants in the room, I promise you, if you overlay your culture results with your business performance data, there will be correlation. And in, in my experience, let that data do the convincing for you if you've got senior leadership teams um, that maybe are a little bit, you know, culture's fluffy. Develop your people into, into leaders. Um, we've made it an expectation at Shape. It's kind of the way we do things around here, that people are in your care. Make the tough decisions when people aren't going to get there. Encourage teamwork. Um, this has just been just amazing for us in terms of really encouraging at the ground level our project members to understand what their behaviours and how they impact each other uh, and develop, develop opportunities for them to come together and practise uh, that in a safe environment. And finally, ensure culture is aligned to your KPIs and reward programs, because if the rest doesn't do it, that will. Thank you.